that it is to welcome you today <clears throat> on this Lord's Day to be able to worship in a very unusual setting because of COVID-19. My name is Nick Garland. I'm the new interim pastor of First Baptist Church of Tahlequah. And though obviously I can't see you, you can see me. And it's a delight today, most of all, to be in the presence of the Lord. Our nation, along with nations of the earth today, are holed up because of a virus. I'm very grateful that we've been healthy and you're healthy or you wouldn't be watching. And we can thank God for his goodness to protect us. But we want to pray for the globe and for all that are affected by this virus, both those in the hospital, those who have been found as a positive carrier, a person who has the illness. And we want to just ask God to comfort families where they've lost someone because of COVID. So would you pray with me? And then we're going to look at a word of hope from the word of God. Would you join me and let's pray. Father, how grateful we are that you're the God of all things. And what may seem a surprise to us did not catch you off guard. That means that in the midst of this, your grace is manifested, your power is being made known. As we move away from our regular routine, it gives us great opportunity to seek the face of God. For those who are your people, that's natural. For those who are, and I pray this can be a season, they'll become aware of the goodness of the Lord. Help us to be light in the darkness and sources of hope in times of difficulty and despair. We pray for families that are reeling because a family member has been affected by the virus. We pray for those who are sorrowful because somebody has died because of it. And those who are simply fearful because they hear the news daily of the concerns about COVID-19. We're grateful we know you. You are our help and strength. And so today it's a joy to be in your presence. Help us as we study your word to have eyes to see and ears to hear from the very spirit of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. I don't have to tell you our world has been turned upside down. Who would have ever thought that something as small as a virus could stop the earth? We were watching for nuclear, we were watching for earthquakes, watching for tsunamis, watching for volcanoes. It didn't take that, did it? It just reminds us how fragile and frail we are. Cities are now on lockdown. We see places where businesses and churches and schools are closed. The news, <clears throat> the news daily now talks about how many people have gotten the virus, how many people globally have it, how many people have tested positive, and sadly, how many have died. All because of a virus. Isn't that amazing? And the angst that creates is enormous. And people all over the world today are fearful, wondering, does my neighbor have it? Did that person I bought groceries from have it? Did the delivery boy have it? I mean, everybody is very conscious that we're washing hands and taking all kinds of hand sanitizers and masks more serious than ever. But in the midst of that and all that anxiety, I want to remind you today what we need, and you know that, is encouragement. We need a different perspective. We see the news, which is human reporting, but what we need is divine perspective, divine insight and hope and a reminder of our foundation. I have one Bible verse that when people ask me what's my favorite, it's the one I quote most often, and it's not in the New Testament. Not that there's not tons of the New Testament I love. It was the prophet Isaiah. The one who caught the vision many years before Christ was born, that unto us a child would be born and a son given. His name would be called Wonderful Counselor. Is that same Isaiah that wrote the text I want to share with you today briefly? It's found in Isaiah 41.10. There's seven phrases. It's been called the week of prayer, where you pray each phrase or each thought one a day for a week. Here it is. Fear thou not, Isaiah wrote, Isaiah 41.10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my strong right hand of righteousness. Today I want to focus on three, maybe four of those if I have the time, to consider what that really means for us as believers. Fear thou not. The first thing that means is just what it says, fear not, because frequently it's the word God spoke when he was getting ready to do something with his people. Why? If an angel appeared, the first thing I'd feel is fear. If God Almighty appeared to blinding light as, as he did to Saul of Tarsus, I'd be afraid. If, if the light of God filled a, a dungeon cell as he did with Peter, I'd be afraid. That's why so often when God greets his people, he says, for instance, in Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, But now says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, he forms you, fear not, for I've redeemed you. In Exodus 14, he says to Moses, fear ye not and be still and see the salvation of the Lord as he faced the Red Sea. In Deuteronomy 31, he said to Moses, The Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. 
when he appeared to the Virgin Mary, the angel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary, teenager. Can you imagine the, the fear and the stu sudden sense of awe when a little girl, a young woman, a very young teenager said, saw an angel and first thing out of his mouth was fear not. Now listen, that, we say that very calmly. I'm sure she was quaking in her sandals. Fear not, Mary, you found favor with God. When those shepherds in the shepherd's field were watching flocks by night, suddenly there was an angel from heaven and the first words out of his mouth, fear not. Are you kidding me? I'd be catatonic. In the darkness, there's suddenly the light of heaven and angelic, angelic beings that you are beginning to wonder, did, did I eat something I shouldn't and I'm having a strange dream? Listen, when we come into God's presence, the first thing we want to remember is not only does he say, fear not for our good, but we fear not because we're told to fear not because this awesome being who is the divine, the divine deity, that awesome being is our Father, our Creator, the one who loves us. There's a problem with fear. The world's filled with it right now. And here's what's wrong with fear. Fear always warps our view of the present. We are seeing many, many good things happen. In fact, in this virus season, think of all the good things you're seeing. You're seeing people come together and give and make available special medical opportunities and special uh, ministry to neighbors and others checking on neighbors and people checking on the elderly and people bringing groceries and supplies. Uh, where'd that come from? from the good hearts of good people that we don't hear about on the news normally, but suddenly those acts of kindness are making headlines. Isn't that amazing? Some of you that are watching this video have been involved in some ministry center, or some way to help your neighbor, or a prayer event on, uh, online to say, listen, we're, we're in this together. And so even in the midst of the fear, we need to remember the present God, God has not changed. Fear makes the past seem better than it was. Occasionally you'll hear somebody say, well, do you remember the good old days? Listen, they weren't good and they weren't old. They were new then. But the problem is we have a poor memory, not a better past. Our grandparents struggled through the same things. In fact, worse than we did. They went through the Great Depression. Our grandparents went through a world war. Our grandparents went through all kinds of difficulties. But they, they remember the good. After all, this is past and it will We'll remember the special moments we have with children and grandchildren and mates and our mate and our family, and it'll be a very special time. Fear always dilutes our faith. It not only distorts reality, it dilutes our faith. You see, you can't look at two things. You, you either look at a human solution or divine deliverance. I love the story of Simon Peter. In fact, most of us, if we're honest, relate better to Peter than any other disciple. Why he was, he, he, was, he was not always right, but he's never in doubt. And he always opened his mouth. And he, we know that he was the one that's in your Sunday school class or your school class. And he always has his hand up. I, I know I, he didn't, but he, he thought he did. And I remember the time when he said, Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And he got the answer right. And if you say this, when Jesus asked, who am I? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I've heard preachers and teachers say, blessed are you, Simon. Listen, tear that, tear that out. That's not true. I think Jesus knew that Simon Peter, he knew his proclivity to have it wrong. And when he finally got it right, I think Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon. Son, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. My Father in heaven reveal that to you. You see, the truth is, it dilutes our faith when we're always looking somewhere other than Christ. When Peter finally saw Jesus... He realized, I know who you are. It's that, same, it's that same Peter. It's that same Peter who, after Jesus fed the 5,000, you remember, he made the disciples, Scripture says in the Gospel of Mark, he forced them to get into the boats because the people were saying, wouldn't he be a great Caesar? They wanted a political Messiah. They wanted somebody to save us now, kind of like the way we do politics ourselves. The truth is, Jesus wasn't here to be a political redeemer. He is here to be a deliverer for eternal life. When Peter and the disciples were kind of stirring up the crowd, said, yeah, well, if, you, if, you, if you get to be Caesar, we're going to be his cabinet. Talk that up more, boys. The Bible says Jesus forced them to get into a boat. And all night long, he told them to go across the sea, and they did. And the Bible says early the next morning, between 3 and 6 in the morning, they saw Jesus walking across the water. Peter, knowing that, believing to be Jesus, said, if it's you, invite me to come. That was Jesus' favorite word. He, he, said it, he said it always, come unto me. Peter said, if that's you, invite me to come. And when Peter stepped out of the boat, the Bible says, as long as he focused on Jesus, he was doing great. That would be true of us. 
But the Bible says a strange thing. He saw the wind. I've never seen wind. I've seen dust in the wind and leaves in the wind and trees blow in the wind. I've never seen wind. He was so afraid. He saw wind and waves. And he began to sink. And you know what Jesus said? He walked over to where he was and he pulled him out of the water. And it's found one time. The Greek word used is found one time in all the New Testament. Peter when were you pulled in two directions? The scripture is interpreted, when did you doubt? But it means you were pulled in two directions. Yesterday you were trying to make me an earthly ruler and I didn't come to be that. And, and today you're in trouble and you call on me. Can you help me as the son of God? Why did you change your focus even for a season? Maybe the reason God has allowed this season in our lives are for some of us who claim to know Christ to come back home to him really focus on him. I dare say some of you have prayed more in recent days than you've prayed maybe in months or years. Some of you are more aware of needing the Lord than you ever have been conscious of in several months or years. Why? Because when all around us begins to become unengaged and unhinged, the answer doesn't lie in Washington, does it? And the answer doesn't lie in the economics, does it? Our hope is in the Lord. And so the Bible says fear can dilute our faith, and we need to remember the word fear. Someone said years ago as an acrostic, F-E-A-R really stands for false evidence appearing real. David said it like this, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Shadows can sure look scary, but shadows have no substance. When David would bring that flock of sheep home into the fold at night and bring them back down through the valley behind every rock as the sun was setting, that shadow big enough, that, that could have a, a bear behind it. That, that one could have a mountain lion behind it. He knew that any shadow could be hiding something that wanted to attack him or his sheep. And I think sometimes our news helps us focus on the shadows, but we know the one who's the light. Sometimes difficulties come because our faith tends to look at man's solutions Versus God's provision. I love that old saying that said, Faith sees the invisible, hears the inaudible, believes the inconceivable, and does the impossible. Faith is always manifested in times of trial. Now, now I don't mean to be ugly. I'm fully capable. I don't mean this ugly. But, but realistically, most of us, when things are going pretty smooth in America, we don't get up every day in an intensive, fervent sense of prayer. God, please help me today. I'm going to my office and I'm facing lots of things and I sure do need your help. No, most of us say, it's going to be a pretty normal day. Now, I'm aware God's here and I think he's with me. Truth is, when you're dealing with everything around you coming unglued, you call on the Lord and you begin to say, listen, I need you now. You understand storms come to reveal how much strength you have. We live in Tornado Alley. After a tornado comes near a city and roofs are blown off or, 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 or trees are uprooted, it's not the tornado that really revealed the weaknesses, though it does. After a tornado, you say, boy, that old building must have built strong. It's still standing. After Corona, I wonder how many are going to come to you because they say, you know, I watched you during the midst of all that trial. And you never wavered in your faith. You have something I don't have. I sure wish I knew, the, knew Christ the way you know him. And right now they're watching to see, are we children of light? Are we children of despair? Listen, look up. We know our Heavenly Father. The Bible says, fear not. Then he says, I am with you. I, I love that word, I am. You remember when Moses was at the burning bush? And God said to him, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And he's standing in front of a fiery bush. Now, I got to tell you, I've talked to some interesting people, but I never saw one burning in front of me. What turned Moses aside was not the bush that was burning. It wasn't consumed while it burned. It just kept burning, but it didn't diminish. It just kept being a living fire because the one in it is a living God. The one manifested is a living God. And the Bible says when Moses was told, go back and tell Pharaoh, uh, that, that I sent you. Now remember, Moses had been reared in Egypt, though his mama was a Jew. He'd been reared in Egypt. Egyptians had gods of everything. And so when he said, you go back and tell them God sent you, Moses asked an honest question. What God? Who shall I say sent me? That's not a stupid question. It's not out of range. If you're reared in the house of Pharaoh and you say there are gods on every, at every pedestal, what God sent me? And I love what God said. He said, you tell him I am. 
that I am. You tell him I am. Do you understand that's eternal present tense? See, see, fear distorts our faith, but, but what happens is God said, I am with you. The I am, not a, I am meaning present tense, but the I am. What does that mean? It means the one who can answer every question you have. Do you understand when Moses went back and told Israel, we're getting out of here and God is going to watch over us. You know what they said? Well, I got some questions. Y'all ever been to a business meeting? I got questions. You the God's going to provide for us? And he used his name, I am. You the God going to feed us? I am. You the God going to provide water for all our flocks and herds in the wilderness? I am. You going to watch over my children? I am. You can't ask one question the name of God doesn't answer. Maybe that'd be good to be reminded of in the 21st century. Are you the God watching over us? I am. Are you the God that calls us your children? I am. Are you the God who sent your son to save us? I am. Do you have a place prepared for us? I am that one. Isn't that good? He said, I don't want you to be afraid. Why? I am. That, that's not only who he is. That's not only what he does. That's who he is. The I am of Moses. The I am of the Old Testament. The I am who sent his son Jesus and said, I am the living water. I am the gate to the, uh, to the sheep. I am, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. All those I am's of the very name of God. He said, I am with you. And that's something God said over and over in Scripture. But then I like this one. He said, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed. I, I, I did a word study. I, I like to do that. Just see what one word, the power punch it makes. Did you know this word dismayed in the Old Testament? You know what it means? It's a picture of a person who's in such anxiety, they're not still. They're just always looking around, feeling like, I know they're coming. I just don't know what direction and, and when, and, and they can't be calm. They're, they're, they're just looking at every, under every rock. I know there's a demon. You don't know anybody like that, but I, I do. They're, if things are going good, they're worried that they've forgotten something. And if they're going bad, they think the whole world's into tomorrow because it's never been like this. It's always been like this. The truth is we live in a decaying world because sin is always at work bringing devastation. Right now we're more aware of it than normal because it brings physical and financial difficulty. But the truth is, the truth is we've always been in a world where the, 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 there's a sense of dismay, a sense of anxiety, a sense of stress, a sense of diversion to keep our eyes off Christ. COVID-19 has created a global crisis and the, the smartest of the medical teams of the world are scratching their heads say, I don't know how to stop this. We're looking. We're going to do our best to find a solution and a, and a, and a drug to cure it and an inoculation to prevent it. But right now, they don't have the answer. Well, sure it seems like to me it'd be a good thing to look to God because the Bible says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Don't be dismayed. Luke chapter 10, I find it interesting when, Mary, when Jesus visited the home of Mary and Martha. You, you remember Mary said at his feet, Martha was mad as a hornet. She's over there, that busy body. She's making sure all the forks are in the right place and all the glasses are clean. The places are set just, the place mats are set just right and the napkins are folded and everything's on the table in time. And Mary just sitting there. Y'all don't know anybody like that at your house, do you? Just sits there with the remote in her hand waiting for dinner to be served. Boy, that just made Martha so mad. When she went to Jesus, she is so mad. Now, you know you're ticked when you take something like this about your sister to the master. Jesus, Jesus, I'm up here working my fingers to the bone and she's just sitting there. Tell her to get up and help me. I like what Jesus said. Martha... You're worried and upset about many things. Few things are really needed. Indeed, there's only one. And Mary has chosen what is better. You know what it says about Mary? She sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Can I, can I just get personal a minute? I, I, may I just get personal a minute? You've probably never said it, but I bet you know people have said, you know, I'd get more involved in Bible study if I just had the time. You know, I'd really get more active in, in, active, in concerted prayer if I, if I just had the time. You know, I'd check with my neighbor about their spiritual condition if I just had the time. Many of you not going to the office, are you? You're not going to the schoolroom. You're not going uh, to, to that business where you, you work with a group of people because 
now you're working from home, you say, yeah, boy, it's just really tough. It is. But you know, now you can just kind of adjust your schedule because some of that time that you're spending is a deadline you got to meet, but it's not backbreaking. And some of you right now could take a 15 minute window, 20 minute window, 30 minute window and get engaged in a Bible study or get engaged in a prayer, a concerted prayer time, an earnest to goodness learning how to pray that could change the nation. You know, the Bible says of Martha, of Mary, she was involved in the best thing while Martha was up very, very busy, but not necessarily productive. The last thing I want to share with you in this text that gets me is he said, I'm your God. The Bible says, fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. Through the years of getting to be a pastor, our churches have been very mission-minded, and our church sent me places I never dreamed I'd go, and some were very heartbreaking. India, Calcutta, India, I think is the darkest and saddest place I've ever been in my life. Terribly religious, but in all the wrong ways. They have Hinduism has tons of gods. God's in this desk. He's in that microphone. He's in this book. I mean, God, God's in everything. They have millions of gods. And the sad thing is they, they worship not out of adoration as we worship our Lord, but they worship out of fear. And so when you see an idol, they, they pay homage to that idol. Maybe that idol won't attack my children or that one won't destroy my, my cow or that one won't hurt my, my house. Or, and so I worship these idols out of fear. I'm going to pay homage and keep, you, keep us on good terms. Isn't that sad? The God we worship isn't made of stone, and the God we worship isn't animistic in that he's in everything but really has power over nothing. The God we serve is the only true God. Do you understand Christianity is unique among all other world faiths? We're not a religion. A religion is man's attempt to reach up to God. I got news for you. Our God came after us. The Bible says in the cool day when Adam and Eve sinned, he was the first one on the job saying, where are you? The Bible says in the days of Noah, he was searching the earth for that one righteous man who walked with God that he could trust to build an ark and deliver to build a new world. The Bible says when man was steeped in sin, God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. He left heaven. You talk about missions. He left a throne where the angels attend his every need to come to the likes of us, to be spat upon, hit, rejected, argued with, crucified. We don't care much for righteousness, do we? That's how we treated the Son of God. But you know what the Bible says? I am. Not because of how you behave. Not because you're always all you need to be. Not because you're always without disease or you're without difficulty or you're without flaws or, or you're without bad thoughts or bad motives or bad aspirations. I'm your God. You see Nick Garland, an old man. When I was a boy, my daddy was a preacher and I remember my daddy, he was a great man, marvelous pastor, good soul winner, great heart. I learned so much from him, not knowing I needed it later as a pastor. But I remember my dad and the way that he would go about leading. And I think it's interesting that like God, he would remind us what he wanted us to be. He would continually remind us that he loved us. But then he also reminded us, if you don't do well, there, there's a price to be paid. Not being well in school, but if you, don't, if you disobey. God says, I love you. And I don't want you to have to go through this. But sadly, we're boneheaded and we keep doing the same foolish things that bring the same results and expect it to be different. COVID's given us the opportunity to do some evaluation. And God said, I know you. I'm your God. Now listen to this. That means he, he knit us together in our mother's womb. That's what the Bible says. It says he knows the number of the hairs of our head. That's pretty in, intimate. The Bible says he knows the words on our lips before they're formed. He knows the end from the beginning. You know what the Bible says his name is? Alpha and Omega. You know, you don't even have to be an English scholar to get this. I'm going to ask a real hard question. What comes before the letter A? Nothing. What comes after the letter Z? Nothing. That means before God, there was what? Nothing. I'm Alpha. That's the Greek A. I'm Omega. That's the Greek Z. He said, before me, there's nothing. After me, there's nothing. Because I am, forever present tense, your God. I like that. The Bible teaches us, I will strengthen you. That means I'm going to help you be courageous. I'll help you to be an overcomer. And I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. Many years ago, there was a sweet lady from Sweden 
Her name was Carolina Sandelberg. She had the name Lena. She's been called the Fanny Crosby of Sweden because she wrote so many hymns, but hymns we don't sing so much anymore. But hymns really are testimonies of a person's life put to music, testimonies of their faith journey. It was this sweet lady who wrote a hymn that we used to sing often, and many people have found it very helpful in this present age of COVID. In, in, in October, uh, excuse me, in 1832, she was born. But as a young lady, her father, who was a Lutheran minister, they were on a, a, a ship traveling uh, the, the ocean, and, and uh, uh, there was a way that came, and the ship lurched, and she watched her Lutheran father fall off the deck and drown. It crushed her. She was a daddy's girl. She would write a hymn as a result, thinking about the power of God, and here's what it says. Day by day, that's where we are now. And with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure, he gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain or pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. The Bible says, fear not, I'm your God. Don't, don't be dismayed, always looking for the next problem. Don't be dismayed. Listen to what he said. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you up with my righteous right hand. Let's ask him today to do that. Would you pray with me? Father, it may be today someone even listening to this, this recording of a sermon will be touched by the hand of God and say, Pastor, I wish that I could really trust in God, but I don't. I never have. I, I don't even know him. There's likely some listening say, Pastor, I, I made a commitment when I was a child, but be honest, I, I know about God more than knowing Him as a personal presence. Boy, now would be a great time. Now would be a great time to call on the Lord. He's near, you know, and He doesn't give us these promises in vain. So it might be today there's someone listening that would say, Pastor, if I had the opportunity, I sure would like to take Christ as my Savior. I surely would like to draw near to God and ask Him to draw near to me then here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for you. And right now in this simple prayer, this isn't a magical act. I have no power. I'm a man like any man or woman listening as an individual. I'm a human being. But right now, we're going to talk to God. And when we talk to Him, these words have to come from your heart of faith. And as you say them, you're saying, I really believe what I'm saying. I'm going to ask God to forgive me and to give me eternal life. Here's that prayer. If you say, I need to know Jesus right now, would you ask him to come into your life and change you? Here's the prayer. Father, repeat after me. I know I've done a lot of things wrong. And the Bible calls that sin. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me of all my sin. Thank you, God, for loving me. Enough to send Jesus to die on the cross to pay for my sin. I turn my back on my sin. I trust Jesus that he died for me to pay for my sin. Today I put my trust in Jesus to give me eternal life. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Live your life through me. And Father, prepare a place in heaven for me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, I'd encourage you to seek out a trusted Christian friend. And say, you know, today I was listening to a sermon on a video and I prayed to receive Christ. I don't know what to do, but that's what I did. And I pray that Christian friend will point you to church and say, come with me. And I pray that they'll encourage you to take a scripture and begin to read the gospel of John a chapter a day. And I pray very soon you'll be baptized. You say, well, I don't have a friend that goes to church. Well, I know a good one. If you'll come to First Baptist Church of Tahlequah, they're eager to receive you, and these are good people who will love you and surround you and help you grow in the faith. You come to First Baptist Tahlequah at your first convenience and just give them a call in this COVID crisis and say, I prayed to receive Christ. Can you help me? And I'm going to give the answer. Yes, I will. God bless you all. Thanks for joining us today.